what up? Yo. Peace, legend. Peace, what's good? Hey, man, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, today, I don't want to waste any time. I want to give you your flowers. I basically want to go over your discography. Yeah. Uh, for, those, for those who may uh, forgot or may have not know, uh, I want to go and delve into some uh, highlights of your career that uh, I think the fans would like to know, as well as myself, maybe some fun facts behind them. And also, we're on the eve of the 25th anniversary of Reasonable Doubt, which dropped almost uh, 25 years, so that'd be tomorrow. So it'd be great to get a little insight uh, about that album as well. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know, you're from North Carolina. How did you end up getting into hip hop? Man, um, junior high school, somebody played Run DMC, Suck MCs. After that, I'm like, I want to rap too. I can do it. I know I can do it, like type vibe, you know what I mean? Right. It, it just, it just, it was crazy, bro. You know, that first moment I was like, you know, I fell in love as soon as I heard the record. So what was next for you? Uh, the the pad and the pen or picking up uh, the produ production skills? Oh, pad and the pen. I mean, I wasn't producing for a minute. I was, uh, I was in a rap group and I had a producer. He did all the beats for me, my homeboy Fanatic. And I was strictly MC, man. I was trying to, you know, be famous, a famous rapper and all that type of stuff. You know what I mean? Right. So the group was Busy Boys. Take us back to how you guys met and uh, formed the group. I uh, met in high school, man. Um, my A good friend of mine, go by the name of Eli Davis, he uh, introduced me to Fanatic. And he, he was in a rap group called the Crush MCs, but one of the MCs, you know, he was about to leave. So he asked me if I wanted to be in the group. And he heard me spit and he, you know, he liked what I was doing. And so we changed the name to the Busy Boys, man. You know, and, and we just took it from there, man, every day, just, you know, writing rhymes, making music, and, and creating, pretty much. Uh, did you guys end up shopping a demo earlier on? Nah, nah, we were straight independent, man. We wasn't even thinking about record deals back then. We was just, we was making our own records and putting it out on the radio and, you know, just getting love in NC, man. Big shout out to Greensboro, North Carolina. Obviously, that's where I started, you know? No doubt. The name of the album was Dropping It. What kind of feedback did you guys get when that album came out? And uh, what was that, 1990? Yep, something like that. We got great feedback, man. Uh, actually, one of the records, the song Dropping It and the song Hype Time was getting, like, airplay in New York City. That's what kind of, you know, led us to, well, led me to move to New York. Can you talk about that transition to New York? Uh, what time period and uh, what was you seeing uh, when you uh, touched down in New York? Man, it was like around 90. I moved to New York uh, with the owner of the label, Roland Jones. God bless his soul. Um, he was from New York. It was me, him, and this kid named Nagorn. We all moved up. And, um, man, crazy. You know, me being from NC and, and moving to the big city, you know, the home of hip-hop, yada, yada, yada. You know, I was definitely fascinated with everything that was going on. And as soon as, you know, I got to New York, well, really, I started in Jersey, but as soon as I got to Jersey, as soon as my feet hit the ground, you know, I was trying everything, you know, making music and 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 writing rhymes and just trying to get on, bro. Just trying to get on. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you eventually eventually get noticed? Uh, was it Clark Kent that took you under his wing? Yeah. Well, I, you know what? Me being in the Busy Boys. All the major acts that came into North Carolina at that time, we used to open up for them. So I met Clark a while ago when he was DJing for Dana Day. <clears throat> and he was like, yo, if you ever come to New York, you know, look me up. And, um, you know, when I had my demo together with Original Flavor, I hit him up, gave him the tape. He liked it. And next thing you know, we had a deal, man. Can you take us back briefly to how uh, Original Flavor was form formed? Um, yeah, man. Um, I was in Jersey, you know, in the studio working on some music. And this cop and my partner soon to be suave lover came to the studio and they was looking for beats and they heard me in the back making some music and it was like yo you know these are your beats and i'm like yeah you know you know i cook up sometime you know i'll be making beats for myself and the cop was like yo so where do you live and i and at the time i was living in that studio and i'm like i live right here and he said well listen i got an apartment in harlem i don't stay there i sold my girl they got a full studio if you make beats for me i'll let you stay in that apartment for free so I said, you know, he's a cop. He might be all right. Let me check it out. 
So I went to Harlem, saw the apartment. It was cool. Had a full studio. And, yo, I started making beats. And the kid that was with him, Suave, he used to come by because he wanted me to make music with him, too. And I said, yo, fuck it, dude. Let's just do some shit together. Let's make an album. Call it Original Flavor. And then we start working on the demo. That's how that shit came about. Right. You guys yeah. end up getting with Atlantic. Were there other labels that you shop for uh, with? And uh, Atlantic was it? That was it. I didn't even, I wasn't even trying to shop. You know what I'm saying? I just knew Clark and I just gave it to him. And I didn't even think I was going to get a deal, but it happened. Right. Uh, can you detail what that uh, deal consisted of? One album, two album, multi-album deal? It was it was it was a multi album deal, but we ended up only doing two albums with Atlantic. And um, the same time I got the deal, Dame Dash was there. So okay. the day I went to the um, actual building, you know, to sign the paperwork, Dame Dash was sitting in Clark's office, and Clark was like, "Yo, this is my boy Dame. He love what you're doing. He want to manage you." And I'm young. I'm like, "Yo, let's go. Whatever. Just let me sign the paper so I can hit you know hit the ground and go." And um, but it was good. You know, I met Dame and. You know, smart brother. You know, he was just learning the game. And, you know, I was just, you know, learning the game. On that side of the thing, it was dope, bro. It was really good. What kind of earlier discussions did you have with the group members as far as the vision for uh, This Is How It Is uh, when you guys dropped it in 92? What kind of discussions did you have as far as the direction you wanted to go with that album? Man, we just knew that, you know, we wanted to definitely – you know, deal with the whole jazz aspect aspect of hip hop since that was kind of popping back then. And I was a big fan of, you know, Tribe Called Quest and, you know, leaders of the new school groups that was using jazz in their hip hop. So we was definitely influenced by that type of vibe back then. Right. You mm -hmm. say Dame is in the picture at this time. At what point does Jay-Z uh, become in the picture? Uh, man, Jay-Z came a little later, maybe like a year later. Um, Clark introduced uh, Jay to Dame, say, you know, you need to manage this kid. He's crazy. You know, obviously, we heard him rap, and he was amazing. And, you know, he, after that, you know, we was joined at the hip. Everywhere Original Flavor went, Jay was there. So and what was the... That's, that's, how the song, that's how the song Can I Get Open, you know, came about, because, you know, he was trying to do his thing. So we was like, fuck it. We had a deal. Let's throw him on the song. Right. Mm -hmm. What uh, what was the plan going into the second album, Beyond Flavor? And what did you learn uh, as far as trial and error going into uh, the second album from the first? Well, I learned to get paid for my production because I didn't get paid for my production on the first album, which was cool because Dame didn't really know. Nobody really knew. Like I said, it was our first time. So I got paid for producing the um, second album. And I also got introduced to the production game. See me, I'm thinking like every rapper should know how to produce their music. I didn't know what a producer was until Clark pulled me to the side and was like, yo, bro, you got any more beats? And I gave him a few beats. Next thing you know, you know, he was selling them, you know, and I was making money for production. That's how I got into that whole production thing. But my focus was not making beats. My focus was rapping. I just knew how to make beats and I knew what I wanted to rap to. So anything I felt like I could rap to, I knew somebody else could rap to. And, um, right. And I definitely learned, you know, about uh, the whole marketing thing, the whole, you know, um, independent budgets uh, for promotions and going out on the road and doing promotional tours, all the stuff, radio runs. I learned all that stuff by doing those albums and working with Atlantic Records, which was a great experience, man, because, you know, we met a lot of cool people, went a lot of cool places, you know, built a lot of cool relationships to this day. What, uh, what kind of reception did you guys get off that first album? It was good, man. You know, for, for what it was, you know, we wasn't like no major superstars, but we was popping in New York, you know what I mean? And right. for, you know, a young rapper being in New York and everybody kind of knowing what's going on, it felt good, man. We was doing shows, we had videos out, people knew what it was, and, you know, it we, we, we was respected. Uh, what do you remember most about the session with Jay-Z as far as uh, Can I Get Open? Um, Man, he was just, you know, he was just obviously incredibly nice on the mic. Um, quiet dude, you know what I'm saying? Didn't really talk much, but you know when he when he when he got into his zone and when he did his thing, it was just amazing, man. And man, funny, <laughs> right? Man, funny kid, yeah. Um, what kind of reception did that get when it came out? Your second album? Uh, it was good. You know, everybody was definitely fucking with the Can I Get Open. Um, did a lot of shows. You know, same thing. Blah blah blah. It was like right. you know, what I'm saying it felt good. It felt good. Right. Around yeah. this time, what do you consider your greatest tour memory uh, off your two albums and being with Original Flavor? My first time kind of going out of the country, man, 
well, sort of going out of the country. Went to Puerto Rico, did a show, and it was packed. Nobody could speak English, but everybody knew the lyrics to the song. And I was like, yo, this is fucking wild. So, uh, so what eventually happened to the group Original Flavor? Well, um, us being on Atlantic Records, you know, we wasn't moving units, so we eventually got dropped. And me at the time, you know, I, you know, I didn't care because I was doing production, so I was good anyway. But my partner, you know, he was kind of, you know, on the fence with it. But, but you know, he bounced back and got this, his shit together. Right. But I was cool with it. I, you know, I was like, fuck it, we're free. We can do whatever the fuck we want to. Now, we done built our buzz with them. Now we can just kind of, you know, keep going. Where did uh, Ski Beats find itself after his deal with Atlantic? I found myself producing, you know, more artists. You know, while I was working on Reasonable Doubt, obviously I was doing Uptown Saturday Night with Camp Low. So I had them popping. And then around that time, I got offered a label deal uh, with Rough House Records. So I did rock block Records where I had the Sporty Thieves, Pace One, Richie Thumbs, people like that. So I was always, you know, moving around, doing stuff. All right. If we can just back up a little bit, you produced uh, Jay-Z's In My Lifetime. So was you guys uh, hip and hip uh, after the Atlantic deal? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. Sure. So can you talk about that, uh, the earlier process of Reasonable Doubt uh, going into In My Lifetime and, and seeing that process uh, take form? So In My Lifetime, um, like right after Reasonable Doubt, we was working on that album. And I wasn't like there as much as I was for Reasonable Doubt because like I said before, I was doing rock block I had my own little thing going on. So, But right. I did get a chance to do the Who You With and She's Just Watching. Well, I, I'm, I'm talking about the song In My Lifetime in 95. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was the first one I did with Jay. Right. So if we can back it up a little bit. So take me back to 95 in my lifetime. Oh, shit, man. Wow. That was the first time I did a song with Jay. And that was actually the first time I kind of knew, you know, that he was doing his thing in the streets. I didn't know. I just thought he was a, a fast rapper, you know, that type of thing. But when we did that record, you know, certain things started to come into play. You know, I started to see, like, you know, the... Um, vehicles pull up and bottles and, and jewelry and shit. I'm like, yo, where all this shit coming from? And I <laughs> had no idea he was kind of doing his thing for real, for real. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Uh, how did you uh, link up with AZ for uh, Your World Don't Stop? You co-produced that or fully produced that? Uh, it was actually a remix. What happened was the producer who produced the original, he couldn't clear the sample. And uh, his A&R reached out to me and asked me if I could, you know, do something with it. And I, you know, I put the track together for him and that was that. Just some regular uh, independent work. That's all that was. Were you uh, in the session with him or did you just do the track and pass it on? Yeah. yeah. Had the lyrics and I just did the track, built it around that. Right. Moving on to 1996, you got to work with Bahamadia? Yeah, yeah, for sure. What do you remember most about those sessions? Well, at the time, you know, everybody was working out of D&D Studios, mostly everybody that was doing records. And Primo, you know, he's a fucking fixture in D&D Studios, and Bahamadia was his artist. And every time I was in the studio, she was there, and then one day, you know, she just came into the session where I was in, we was chopping it up, and she was like, hey, man, I would love a track from you. And I just so happened to have that beat in the SP-1200 I played it for, and, and damn, we might have recorded it that day. It was crazy. Also, 96, uh, tomorrow, like I said, the 25th anniversary of Reasonable Doubt. What do you remember most going into that uh, particular project? Mm, going into, uh, into Reasonable Doubt? Man, it was a project before I even knew it was a project, you know, because we was always working on songs. You know, right. we had an album before Reasonable Doubt, you know what I mean? And, dude, it just happened. You know, Clark was had all these songs and I started going to the studio. The next thing you know, you know, they talking about, yo, we're gonna, we're gonna make an album. We're gonna put out our own album. And then boom, it was reasonable doubt. So I never knew ahead of time that we was working on the album. I just know we was always working. Right. Uh, at this time, were you already working with Camp Low? Cause there's a rumor that Jay took some of their beats and used them for reasonable doubt. Is there any truth to that? Not at all. Like, everybody thinks feeling it was uh, Camp Lowe's record, but it was my record. I was working on a, a solo project, and I had Geechee Suede on it, and my homegirl Mecca was singing the hook. And, um, you know, Jay heard the beat, and obviously he wanted to use it, so I gave it to him. But um, while I was doing Reasonable Doubt, I was working on Camp Lowe at the same time. Okay. So there was always, you know, always that little tension, like I'll play a beat, 
for low, and they'll be like, who beat is that? I'm like, Jay-Z. Then I'll play a beat. You know, I might play a Camp Low beat for Jay, and he's like, what's that? Camp Low, you know what I'm saying? They would get kind of mad, but, you know, that's just like... <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, if you can give us maybe some fun facts, you did uh, four tracks on Reasonable Doubt. Is that correct? Uh, who, uh, feeling It, Politics, Dead Press, uh, who... Um, 22 twos? Twos, yeah, four joints. Okay, so I'm a list. Politics as usual. Is there anything you could tell us that we may not know about that particular track? Man, I done told the story a million times, bro. I'm like, you know, I'm driving with my baby's mom, you know what I'm saying? We got the radio on. That, you know, the stylics just come on. I'm like, oh, that's crazy. I know jail kill that. So we make a B turn, go to the uh, mall, buy the CD. I go home, make the beat that night, play it for Jay. Next thing you know, politics. You know what I'm saying? That's how that happened. Straight like that. Very dope. Dead presidents. Dead presidents. Man, I was inspired to make that song when I heard Pete Rock, The World Is Yours. I was at one of those conventions. I heard that song. I'm like, yo, this is amazing. I want to do a song like that. So I started digging until I found a vibe through Nas's voice on it, just to hear if it would fit. And um, it sounded dope to me. Played it for Jay. And then the Nas hook came in. And I said, don't worry about that. I'm going to take it out. And obviously he said, nah, keep it in. And boom, that's how that joint came to be. But the funny thing is, uh, Cameron rapped on that beat first. Not Cameron, Mace rapped on it first before I, mm. I let it hear it. And a lot of people don't know that. But, you know, we didn't use it, obviously. You still have it? No, hell no. <laughs> Feeling it. Feeling it. Like I said, that was my track, you know. I worked hard for that track, man. I was in the house for hours working on this song. I ran over to Dame's crib. I said, yo, I think I got me a fucking record B. Played it for him. And Jay was like, nah, dog, that's my record. <laughs> And I said, fuck it, you can have it. You know what I'm saying? He took the hook, the flow, and everything. Right. Uh, 22 Twos. Hated that song. I didn't even want to give him that beat, man. 22 Twos was a, was a rap that he did at all the shows. And he just wanted to turn it into a song. But I had a better beat for it, but he picked that beat. And people like that song, whatever, you know what I'm saying? But that's like my least favorite record in my life. The right. beat, the beat, not the song, the beat. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you remember most about this time, Reasonable Doubt? Personally, I bought the album. First day it came out, it was a slow burn to me because I was too busy on my Tribe Called Quest-ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? So what did you uh, visually see when the album came out? Was it a slow burner? Did people go back maybe later after uh, Hard Knock Life to pick this up? Well, or I mean, it, it, was, it was definitely a, a slow burn, but it was in the streets, man. Every time you went outside, it was in those cars, man. It was playing in the city heavy you know what i'm saying the streets love that shit right mm -hmm. uh best memory uh, uh, of that time uh, with reasonable doubt best memory it's too many man being in the studio working on reasonable doubt while biggie's in there with primo doing his thing and me going into biggie's session playing beats that i'm gonna get a jay-z you know what i'm saying and him going crazy over that shit a lot of memories bro a lot of memories very dope. Uh, 96, you also got with Lil' Kim on Hardcore. Can you take us back to how that happened? Um, shit. I, once again, that's another A&R reaching out to me, saying Lil' Kim needs some tracks. Um, sent him the track. You know, she wrote to it, went to the studio, heard it. She was dope. She was there. Biggie was there. Sees everybody was there when she was laying it down. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you was working on Camp Lowe's the same time as uh, Reasonable Doubt, but uh, Uptown Saturday Night came out in 97. Can you take us back to that recording process? Oh, with Camp Lowe? Yeah. Man, amazing. I mean, they were my brothers, man. They was in my house every day. We was banging out like five songs a night. The fucking album, they got a deal off the demo. The demo is all other songs, like 10 other songs. And then we redid it and made a whole album. You know what I'm saying? So that was amazing, man. We got the deal from the demo. Then once they got the deal, we started making new songs, and that's how we came up with Uptown Saturday Night. Uh, you guys worked on many other projects throughout the years. What is it about those guys' work that the, that uh, Ski Beats uh, continuously works with them? Man, you know, they first of all, first and foremost, you know, my brothers, I love them. You know, I've been down with them forever. You know, they lived on my same block. And, you know, obviously they just – are amazingly ahead of their time with the fashion and with the wordplay. Like, no, to this day, nobody's talking like Kim Lowe. You know what I mean? Their slang is out of control. And when I met them, that's how they talk. 
to each other. So I'm like, yo, you guys is fucking crazy. And <laughs> put that shit on fucking on music. That was even more crazy. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, like you said, you worked with In My Lifetime on uh, Volume 1 with Jay-Z. Uh, you produced Streets is Watching as well as Who You With. Yeah. Can you take us back to uh, maybe that moment in time? What do you remember most about uh, Volume 1? Uh, remember, okay, the Who You With record. I remember going to Dame's crib. He had moved to Jersey. He was like, yo, we need a record for the Sprung soundtrack, which he got. You know, so I went to the studio, came up with the Who You With beat. You know, Jay did his thing with that. And Streets is Watching was just like, it took me like a long time to actually get the beat right because it was hard to chop. But when I finally got it together, I played it for Jay, you know. I mean, he, he, he man, come on. I think the verse on that bitch is like 32 bars, something crazy. I'm like, dude, you need to make hooks and break it down. He was like, nah, I'm going to keep it just like this. I wish he would have broke that bitch down, man. That would have been even crazier. But it was dope. It came out dope. I loved it. Right. Yeah. Uh, you spoke a little bit about the Rock Block label. Is this about the time uh, you uh, signed that deal for your own label? Yeah, yeah. Around the same okay. time. Yeah. Can you break that down, how that all came about? Well, you know, shit, man. We had Dead Presidents. Lucini and Bahamadia record on the Billboard charts at the same time. And it was all like in the top 10 or whatever. And um, shit, Rough House reached out to me. It was like, we want to give you your own label. And I, you know, I went for it. That's why, you know, you don't hear me on a lot of, everybody was like, yo, what happened to Ski? He just disappeared. Why he ain't working with Jay? Because I was trying to do my own thing. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't no love loss. It wasn't like Jay wasn't fucking with me. It was just like, you know, I had to see if I could, if I can make my own Rockefeller, you know what I mean? Right. Can mm -hmm. you speak about some of the groups that were on that label? Oh, yeah, on um, Rocket Block, yeah. Um, obviously, Sporty Thieves, that's the most, you know, famous group from my label, and, and Pace One. Oh, and right, we right, right. Kid. We had another artist, Richie Thumbs, but we never got a chance to actually drop his music. Mm -hmm. In 98, you also work with Funk Dubious? Funk Dubious, God, yeah, I worked with Dubious. I can't, I can barely remember that time, man. Wow, I can barely remember doing that record, honestly. But yeah, I definitely did something for Funk Dubious. Uh, Lord Tariq and Peter Guns, what do you remember most about working with them? Them being in the Bronx, me living in the Bronx, you know, uh, Pete picking me up, you know, what I'm saying, with us going to the studio. I'm in the studio, pun, he's in there, you know, what I'm saying we're laying the song down, and, and you know. The, Mad cool dudes, bro. We, we had a good time. That was a great session, man. To this day, me and Peter's close. Right. Uh, can you take us back to that Sporty Thieves album? Uh, what that consisted of, the uh, sessions, uh, and personally, how did it uh, take Ski to the next level? Man, Sporty Thieves, man. Another group that's fucking enjoy to work with. Super creative. I mean, if you listen to that Street Cinema Adam album, you knew what it was. It was like it was painting pictures, man. It was kind of, it went over people's heads because it was just so abstract. But I love the fact that they was like that. I love like abstract artists, obviously. Um, and um, when they when they did the Pigeons record and it kind of took them, you know, where they wanted to go. I mean, I didn't like the direction because I knew it was going to be hard for them to kind of bounce back from doing a song like that. I'm like, you know, you guys are lyrical. You guys make some real dope hip hop, but that's going to kind of put you, uh, no pun intended, but pigeonhole you a little bit. You feel me? Because people right. gonna, like they don't want more records like that. And um, I think that's what kind of happened with them. But to this day, though, they still nice. And yo, rest in peace, Brando, one of right. the out there. Is Rock a Block still uh, something uh, at the moment, or did that end up uh, going to the wayside? I mean, Rock a Block is me, man. You know, I, I might bring it back. I might not. You know, if I find an artist, I haven't been really looking for no artists you know what i've been doing i've been doing the smack packs and and and, and the academia stuff right now that's what that's my main focus you feel me right mm -hmm. uh in 98 you also did uh what is considered one of the most uh you know uh favorites uh, uh hip-hop posse tracks uh, of that era uh with john blaze with uh ray nas jada pun can you take us back to uh crafting that track for those uh, uh creative geniuses yeah, man, uh, that was a re that was another remix, and uh, Joe, you know, he needed a track for it, and um, shit, they sent me to the studio. It was me, Joe, and my man Reef, and uh, I made the beat on the spot. I made it like right there on the spot. We called up the violin lady. She put the violins. Reef added the cuts, and boom, she came out like that. 
Were you in that session when the guys laid those vocals down? Mm -mm. I wasn't there for the original vocals, but you know, I was there to, to do the remix with Joe. That was just as impactful for me, you know? Right, right. Uh, around 2005, you got to work with the late, great Proof? Yeah, yes. Can you give us a great memory of that particular uh, individual? Well, Proof was always, I was in North Carolina and Proof was all the way on the other side of wherever. And, um, you know, he just called me up and said he needed a beat. And yeah, at the time I, you know, I had, you know, some, 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 some different shit I was working on. I sent him that, that jump bitch <laughs> track and he killed it, man. You know, that, that whole Detroit scene is crazy. And what he was talking about was, wow. <laughs> <laughs> right. I seen you on tour a few times with Currency. Can you take us back to how you guys met and started working with each other? I met Currency through Dame, man. You know, the whole DD172 movement. One of Dame nephews was telling um, him about Currency, that he should work with him. And uh, Dame, I think Dame flew him out to his crib. And, you know, he called me to come over to his house. He wanted me to meet him. So I got there. You know, Currency was there, obviously. And uh, he was telling me, Currency was telling me, like, you know, he liked what I was, what I was doing with Jay-Z, you know, uh, Camp Law and all that. And he wanted to work with me. And I asked him where he was from because I had never heard of him before. He said, I'm from New Orleans. And so, you know, instantly my mind was like, oh, damn, I'm going to have to make some bounce music or something. <laughs> this kid. And he said, nah, man, I like what you do. I want you to do what you do. So when I, you know, the more I got to know him, I saw that he liked to smoke. I saw he liked the smooth vibe, like that Marvin Gaye shit. And I said, you know what? We're going to go musical. So we took that route and just, you know, kind of created a whole musical soundscape for him. And it fit. It fit him good. Very dope. Can you take us back to the concept behind 24-Hour Karate School? Man, 24-Hour Karate School. So, yo, we sitting at, um, at DD172s. Me, most Def, Currency, and Dane, we sitting at the table. We had just finished doing something, maybe shooting a video for Taxi or whatever. Um, and Currency, he just was like, yo, man, it's like a 24-Hour Karate School in here. We don't ever go to sleep. And you know me, as soon as I heard that name, I'm like, bang. I said, oh, that's what I'm going to call the album. 24-hour karate school because <laughs> it just sounded so wild and that just you know the, that whole era just sprung you know sprung the dojo sprung the sensei sprung everything that you know that i'm doing now right uh some of your favorite memories of putting that as well as twilight together man just the whole energy how everything was going down everything was spontaneous you know we didn't like have anything planned like uh a jail electronica might be coming to go visit dame just to say what's up and then, you know, you know, Dame, you know, he'll hustle. He'll say, yo, you should go check out Ski in the Back. As soon as he come to the back, he see me in there banging out. And then Dame like, yo, spit a verse on that, Jay. And boom, now we got a verse with Jay Electronica. Everybody that came in there was random. You know what I'm saying? And, it, they would, and Dame would just tell him I was in the back. And somehow I would end up making songs with him. Very dope. Uh, mm -hmm. Any more of those series coming up uh, that we can look forward to? Man, yo, I definitely want to do another 24 hour, man. I got to. I got to get it together. Right. Mm -hmm. Have you worked with some stellar MCs uh, uh, throughout the years? Can you take us back to working with Talib Kweli? Talib. Damn, how did that happen, man? I was in North Carolina. And um, shit, how did that happen? I don't even know how he got the beat or even heard that track. Um, but it happened. You know what I mean? And he did his thing, and, 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 it, and it came out really good. And uh, But after the fact, after, you know, when I moved back to New York, I met him, you know what I'm saying? We chopped up, we became cool and shit, but that was dope, you know, that he, he you know, he, he was fucking with one of my tracks, you know what I'm saying? I like that. One of the guys that I think is uh, criminally slept on is Tabby Bonet. Not a lot of people have heard of him. How did, how did you guys link up and, and, and start creating? Um, I used to work with his homeboy, Hazik Ali. And uh, me and Hazik, you know, we, we did a bunch of songs together. And one day, you know, I went to D.C., because Hazik's from D.C. And he said, oh, yo, this is my homie Tabby. He does music, too. And I'm like, you know, that's how I met him originally. And then come to find out, you know, people fuck with him. You know, I heard his song uh, in the pocket and all that. I'm like, oh, he's nice. And then somehow he ended up coming to DD-172. And I'm like, oh, shit, Tabby, I remember you. And we just, you know, automatically clicked and started doing joints. Murs from the West Coast. That was another dang exclusive right there. Merz came to see Dane. Next thing you know, we up in Woodstock fucking making an album. <laughs> <Crazy>. <laughs>
Can you take us back uh, what you've been currently working on throughout the years that we may not have known that may have slept through the cracks? Uh, musically, uh, you know, I did the uh, Switched On Bap, you know, me working with all the, you know, electronic synthesizers and shit. But my main focus, man, has been in the whole academia thing. I got like um, a dojo curriculum right now that's running in the North Carolina school system. We're doing that. And um, obviously, you know, we're doing the smack packs, you know, giving, reaching out and giving um, up and coming producers a chance to shine. So that's my main focus, man, just staying in the academia thing and, and, and pushing these packs, man, and just getting more producers to get involved, man, because, you know, we got a lot of cool, dope-ass young brothers that's doing their thing, you know, and a lot of these guys is getting placements. A lot of these guys is making moves right now. Just from these challenges, we've been doing it, what, since the pandemic? Right. Mm -hmm. At this moment, I'm going to turn this over to some of your supporters. They were DMing me uh, to join. If anybody wants to join and ask you a few questions while we got some time, uh, please request to join. I think DITC, uh, you're up. Possibly. <laughs> oh, there you go. What up, brother? Yo, Ski, Ski I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of yours, man, for a long time. Uh, I respect everything you do, man. I, I love all your productions, man. And uh, the, one, the one question I got is, um, did, did Jay-Z almost get it? Did he try to grab it? Did he try to get it from Camp Flo? Did he almost get it? Nah, 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 nah. It was out before. He heard it after the fact. Okay, okay. All right. All right. That, that's the only question I have, man. But, but, but uh, man, much love to you, bro. And uh, I still jam your joys daily, man. And much respect to you, man. Love all the what you do. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, DITC. Let's see. We got Ether coming on. Ether nine. <laughs> Peace. You. My guy. Hey, what up, baby? <laughs> you know you my guy. I'm just coming in to support you, man. You know you my brother. I appreciate Dojo you always, master. Master. No doubt. You, appreciate bro. you. Keep going, man. Keep going. Yeah, keep you going. Work? Yeah, I'm going to leave. Okay, okay. Holler yeah. at you, brother. Man, I need to see you in some of them challenges, man. Where you at? All right. I'm going to get in the next one. I'm, I'm going to get in 10, man. I'm going to get in 10. I'm in there. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I'll holler at you, brother. All right, baby. Peace. I'll get on. <laughs> Just got to hit your ex somewhere. Oh. Peace. Salute, Sensei. <laughs> How you feeling? Salinske, <laughs> what up, kid? What's going on, big brother? How you doing? Man, you know, I'm in the crib chilling, chilling. You already know what's going on, man. How you doing out there? Man, I'm doing all right, man. You know, same old, same old. Recording, listening to you every day. You know, salute to the Sensei, my big brother. Boy, yo, I, yo I'm, uh, I'm coming home in like a month. I'm going to see you soon. Okay, yeah, you know, well, you already know where I'm at. You know, me and Gab, we're getting that work in, and I know, you know, I've been emailing you. I just want to say, you know how much I love you, man, and salute. I just want to holler at you on everything I love. You know, you already know what it is. Right, baby, same Pay way. Payroll for life. The GOAT, baby. <laughs> a nigga. Yeah. Love you, man. Peace. Peace, peace. Smooth, what What's up, baby? Ain't nothing going on, family. How you doing, man? Cool, man. Can't complain. What's up, brother? How are you? What's your name, bro? Sincere, how you feeling? Sincere, nice to meet you, brother. I'm smooth, man. I'm blessed, bro. Good to see y'all, man. What's up with them Appreciate smack pack speakers, man? Can we get them shits pop? I was just thinking about that shit today. I'm like, my nigga, why he didn't hit me back? I'm ready to get these motherfuckers done. I, I don't do that, Ski. Don't do that. <laughs> I hit you. I got you. Say no more. That's enough said. I got you. We're going to get the sneakers going, smack pack, colony. We doing it. It's going. It's official. There we go. Hell yeah. I How got you, you, my brother. Good, man, I'm, I'm blessed, man. No, I'm, I'm not in L.A. right now. I'm not in L.A. at the moment. I'm okay. blessed, man. It's good to see y'all, man. So whatever y'all got going, I'm supported, man. I see you got some cool things back behind you since there, man. Got I, got a little, I got a little bit of stuff back here, a little, little bit of memorabilia. Say no more, man. We're going to get things going, bro. I'll send you a care package, man. I'm going to get your Instagram after this. I just wanted to tap in, say my peace, man, send my blessings, get my flowers, Ski, man. You already know, bro. I look up to you, man. So it's Absolutely. all love, baby. Thank Appreciate you. you joining in. 
You already know that, man. Y'all stay blessed, man. No right. doubt. Appreciate you. Water. Well, Ski, I'm going to let you get back to your day, man. Like I said, I appreciate this opportunity, especially with the 25th anniversary upon us. Uh, big fan since day one. We've met a few times. I don't know if you remember, but it's all good. Um, you uh, actually DJ for Prodigy. Uh, can you leave us with uh, maybe a good memory of uh, that brother? Man, Prodigy, man, you know, down to earth brother, brother. When you meet him, you know, you're expecting him to be on some other shit, but he's definitely – Good dude, man. Miss him. Miss him. No doubt. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the current state of hip-hop in 2021? Man, you know, it is what it is. Really, man, you know, I feel like back in the 90s and 80s when we was doing our things, you know, our parents was kind of looking at us kind of crazy and shit. <laughs> so, you know, this, these kids, this is what they do. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I wish some of the content was different, obviously. Cause I don't know what you know psychological psychologically what it could be doing, but um, I get it. You know what I'm saying? When you're a kid and you got your thing going on and everybody's doing that, just that's just that thing. That's just that wave. You know, and right? As long as they ain't out there, you know, doing some bullshit. Right. Uh, what can we look for in the future? Uh, everything ski beats. Man, come on, baby. Smack packs, challenges, uh, academia, classes, you know what I'm saying? All that shit. Maybe some music dropping soon. You know, we got to see what happens. Got to see who comes across my radar and see if I want to, you know, get inspired and do some shit, you know? No doubt. Thank you for everything you've done for the culture. Can you leave your social media and everything Ski Beats where we can keep up with you at? At Ski Beats, everything. S-K-I-B-E-A-T-Z. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You already know. Any last words for your supporters before we get out of here? Shit, I appreciate them. You already know. So, love. No. Thank y'all. I appreciate y'all. You know how I feel. No doubt. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Ski Beats, and happy 25th anniversary to you and everything you do. And uh, I will see you in the near future. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. No doubt. Peace. Salute.